Welcome to Two Quants and a Financial Planner, where we bridge the worlds of investing and financial planning to help investors achieve their long-term goals. Join Matt Ziegler, Jack Forehand, and me, Justin Carbonell, as we cover a wide range of investing and planning topics that impact all of us and discuss how we can apply them in the real world to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. All right, guys. Uh, what we decided to do for today was each of us uh, was uh, to read uh, the a letter from Warren Buffett, which was published earlier in the year. Buffett publishes an annual shareholder letter. And what we decide to do is kind of each take it separately, go through it and see what lessons and what sort of things stood out to us when reading the letter. I think they say if you read Buffett's annual shareholder letter along with the Howard Mark memos and maybe Jamie Dimon's uh, or maybe Jeff Bezos's um, former, he, he used to write annual letters. You know, you could kind of, that that's all you kind of needed in, in investing to become a knowledgeable, uh, good long-term investor. I mean, obviously um, along with Matt Ziegler's work on Epsilon Theory, um, you got you to gotta put that in there too. Oh, that too. That's right. Yeah, yeah, clearly, clearly. Right. We will so at that, least that, get that your... went without saying, no, I didn't have to, I didn't need to jump in there. We'll at least get your middle school fashion choices together. That's about as best <laughs> the tip I can give you. But, the, you know, the one thing with Buffett is, and it's interesting, I, was, I recently, somebody recommended Frank Luntz's book. Um, it's called Words That Work. And it's, it's a book about communicating and, the, you know, how to, how to write effectively, basically. And the one thing with Buffett's letters, and I don't know if this sort of jumped out at you or not, but like, the writing is so clear. And, you know, I feel like anyone with any type of knowledge in the market, whether they're not very knowledgeable or super knowledgeable. It's just such a crystal clear message, I think, that comes across in his writing style. And I think for a long time he had, um, I think it was Carol Loomis who edited those letters. Uh, she was a former editor at Fortune, I believe. And she might even still do that. So I think he has like some help there, but it's just an awesome, very simple, easy to read letter. And um, so certainly encourage, these are all on Berkshire Hathaway's site. You can go there. The site looks like it was designed like in like 1999. It's very simple, but underneath on the homepage, you can link off to letters. And so, you know, we, we just wanted to work through this year's letter um, and what lessons we can learn from it. So just to start, I mean, one of the things that most investors know is that Buffett's longtime uh, friend and, and very important colleague and someone that as he coined, was the architect of Berkshire Hathaway. Charlie Munger passed away. And at the very beginning of the letter, in classic Buffett form, he wrote, you know, a very simple but powerful, uh, like one uh, one page um, reflecting on, you know, what Charlie contributed to Buffett. And, and, you know, maybe we can just start there as to what you guys thought about that. Yeah, you know, for, first of all, it was beautiful. I mean, like he, in, in one page, he really got across like the essence of Munger and like that, that's really, really hard to do. And everybody was waiting for him to say something or write something about Munger. And like, he, he waited to the perfect time and he wrote the perfect thing. So like, I thought that was really good, but I actually want to read part of it because it, it was, it was excellent. Um, it, it says in reality, Charlie was the architect of the present Berkshire. And I acted as the general contractor to carry out the day-to-day -day construction of his vision and his vision, which is important. Um, Charlie never sought to take credit for his role as creator, but instead let me take the bows and receive the accolades. In a way, his relationship with me was part older brother, part loving father. Even when he knew he was right, he gave me the reins. And when I blundered, he never, ever, never reminded me of my mistake. In the physical world, great buildings are linked to their architect, while those that have poured the concrete or installed the windows are soon forgotten. Berkshire has become a great company. Though I've long been in charge of the construction crew, Charlie should forever be credited with being the architect. So like that, that was really amazing. And like one of the big lessons I took from this is, is the idea of, well, there's really two things. One is this idea of humility. Like Charlie did all this behind the scenes and never wanted the credit for it. Warren, after the fact, is saying Charlie deserves the credit. Like both of them are showing like extreme humility in crediting the other one for, for what happened here. And you know, that's, that's so uncommon in this world, especially in investing. I mean, there's so many egos in, in investing. Like everybody wants to say, this is me. And like, I, th I thought that was really awesome that like both of them were giving each other credit for obviously something that they both played a huge role in. There's this thing that Warren Buffett does and it's structural. 
and probably beyond the notes that we're going to go over today, one thing that I just think is I love pointing out because it's the, it's the, the grandson and then son of English teachers and newspaper editors. The structuring of these letters is so powerful and <laughs> talk about an architect. Warren Buffett is an architect in these letters and the way he puts them together. That opening sentiment, number one, had to be one of the hardest things the guy's ever written. Like he just lost his business partner and one of his best friends. Like everybody's expecting this. The pressure to write this and get this right, I can't even fathom. Like this feels like writing an obituary for your spouse almost. It's just an incredibly touching and moving thing to see. But beyond that, in a, in a pure structural standpoint, a thing that Buffett always does at the onset of pretty much every every letter is, and I think about this in terms of um, of status. You come into the Berkshire letter and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are demigods. They are way up on the mountain looking down at you and you're opening this letter to see what the value investing gods are about to bestow upon you. And Buffett knows it in every single letter. So what he does is the front of every letter is he deliberately is going to take this status seesaw. He's going to take this thing and he's say, you open this letter and I'm up here and you're down here and I am going to force myself down. And this thing with Charlie, it brings you down where you get it. You're on his level and it's beautiful. And Justin, whether or not this segues into your next point or not, the next thing he does, and he always does it, it's either a mistake they made or something else that went wrong. He wants to take you down even further and elevate up. And he introduces, uh, it's his sister, right? Who's Birdie? Yes. So he introduces mm -hmm. his sister to us. And the idea here is he's now taken us from here and him up there. He told us about Charlie, which made us feel like a human. And now he starts to praise his sister and he's taken that status thing and he's totally brought us in in less in two pages. He has completely brought us into the world. He is now Uncle Warren talking to us again, and he's completely disarmed us to see what he's going to stay because he's no longer on that mountain. It is so well executed over and over again for years. John Grisham would be proud of a body of work like this. That is a excellent point. Um, and thank you for that. Cause that's so something I've never really thought of, but you know, you really hit the nail on the head with that. Um, the, and I think the idea of, you know, we had, uh, Larry Cunningham on the podcast, uh, in the past, and we actually had him on after, after Munger passed away. Uh, but this idea of like quality shareholders and these shareholders that are, you know, and Buffett highlights this in the letter, these shareholders that are with the company for, in some cases, decades. Um, I think this type of style of communication and coming down to that level is one of the very important reasons why Berkshire has such a high quality shareholder class is because people feel like, you know, yeah, I'm investing with Uncle Warren here. And by the way, he's delivered great returns, but, you know, I'm sort of at his level or he's at my level. Um, it's, I don't know what you guys think of that, but. It's so important that he frames that. And I love the connection to the shareholder base because I think it connects both to the shareholder base and the investments that end up on his table uh, or on his lap in front of him or however you want to think about it. On the shareholder base, how many things do we read, especially professional work as asset allocators, like we read stuff all the time from people where it's, I have the answer on high. My model is telling us what to do. And it's, you feel the status imbalance of that form of writing. Every time you read this, and when he goes through the numbers in this annual report of how many shareholders they have and the people he's steward of and whatever else, it's always, it's always so normalizing. And that also means in times like the financial crisis, that's how you get the, the Berkshire Hathaway, Uncle Warren, Uncle Charlie seal of approval on stuff. The American populace, the investor base understands something differently because he never lets you leave him up here. Even though he's earned his spot up here, he's always going to tip that. So powerful in accumulating shareholders and investment opportunities. And, and one of the things you learn in investing is the important of importance of stories. 
And if you, if you take this idea of a high quality shareholder, like there's probably no better way to get that across than let's tell the story of my sister. You know, that, that is like the perfect way. Like he's putting the picture of the high quality shareholder as like a through line through the, almost the whole thing of saying, this is the kind of shareholder we have at Berkshire, which is also kind of saying to me as a shareholder, this is the kind of shareholder you should be like if, if you're a shareholder at Berkshire. So I, I thought that was a brilliant way to do it. Yeah. W with a name, a specific example, like this is all like marketing stuff, but it's like, it's there. When you name it, you frame it. Here it is. Here's Birdie. Here's my sister. Came from the same parent. She's not a CPA. She's not a rock star investor. She comes to the annual conference. Like all the stuff is there. It's if you look through, and again, it was almost, I'm like sob laughing reading this thing because it's like Charlie as architect. And yet I'm looking at this scaffolding that he's hung yet another brilliant annual letter on. It's it's just fantastic. And even the, the name like Birdie, like evokes like grandma, like, you know, been been the shareholder forever. Like, I don't know too many people named Birdie oh, you know, my, my age. So like the whole thing is like perfect. Yeah, it's you're going to choke on your Werther's original. It's incredible. <laughs> The, the other thing that he does a really good job of, he didn't do it as much in this letter, but he did it a little bit is I think he wants to, or there are like some shysters out there that you need to be careful of doing business with. And Berkshire wants to be the company or Buffett wants to be the guy that is so far away from the Wall Street marketing, high fee type of product that, you know, Wall Street pedals, pe pe you know, pedals around that he kind of creates this, like, it's almost like good against evil and, and Berkshire's the good and the evil is all the different things out there that investors can kind of fall victim to. Uh, that's another thing I think that he does quite well in these. And he does a great job with Omaha, like in reference to that, like he spends a whole period of time, like talking about how great Omaha is. And it, and it gets at the whole idea of being outside of Wall Street, being outside of all that stuff, like, and what a benefit it's been. Um, he, he wrote that part really well as, as well, I think. Yeah. And keep, keep these things in mind. He's opening the letter with Omaha, Charlie, all the years and Birdie. That's the opening. Rest assured, as sure as the hero appears at the beginning of the movie. Like it's coming back in the grand finale. So, so I think there are some more tactical, I guess, lessons that we can kind of pull from this. And, and, um, the first thing that kind of jumped out and we'll just kind of work through these points that I have, whatever points you guys have, but you know, he, he does spend time at the beginning talking about the difference between net income and earnings and operating earnings. And this is particularly important for a company like Berkshire Hathaway, because with all the public stock that they own, the net income number takes into consideration the unrealized capital gains or losses uh, of, of that stock. And so it's, a, it's just pretty much a useless number. And he kind of points this out and says, you know, it's the operating earnings. You want to you wanna not worry about those unrealized gains and losses. And you want to focus on, you know, the dividends that came in, plus obviously the, the, the profit generation of all the Berkshire uh, holding companies at the, at the, at the private level. So, you know, that's just something, I think one thing for investors to, to realize is that in a lot of time, in a lot of cases, when you hear net income numbers on CNBC or maybe in a press release, you know, those can be very noisy. And a lot of times you got to clean those up. Yeah. I think that's really important. This whole idea of looking behind the numbers with any company. And, you know, most times when people are saying what Buffett's saying, like, don't pay attention to bottom line earnings, pay attention to this number. Most of the time you're dealing with WeWork or something. You're dealing with like community adjusted EBITDA or something. But in this case, he's 100% right. Um, you know, wh whatever his public holdings are doing in any given quarter has nothing to do with what's going on in the business. So you need to take that out if you're going to understand what's truly going on behind the scenes. And, you know, that's the case with, with tons and tons of businesses is like you need to figure out what the actual relevant metrics are and then you need to pay attention to those and don't get lost in some of this other stuff that can be peripheral to that. And what are the Ella, what are the relevant metrics that work for the thing you're doing. That's part of the brilliance of that idea, Justin, right? Is these are the numbers that are not only important to the company, but these are the important numbers to the company and back to Berkshire. And just refocusing on that is such a strong message. So um, the other the other thing, and this is, this is in all the letters and we talk about this all the time, so we probably don't need to spend too much time on it, but you know, investing really is about always 
successful investing, I believe at least, is, is always about taking a long-term view. And, you know, he gives the example of how, you know, he bought, I think his first, I don't know, his first investment in 1942 when the Dow Jones was at 100. And, you know, it's now at 38,000. And, you know, Buffett really does, and he, not only in this letter, but in a lot of le letters, you know, he really does praise America. And just to quote him from the letter, he says, America has been a, a terrific country for investors. All they needed to do was sit quiet, quietly listening to no one. So the point is, is a lot of times in investing, you know, you make an investment in good companies and good stocks in an index, you sit there patiently, you ride it out. And that's really a great way to compound wealth, you know, over all five or 10 year periods is always going to work out. No, but over, you know, very long period of time, you know, the odds are certainly in your favor that you're going to do well by investing in stocks. Yeah. And I also like this idea that he, he picked up on, he was talking about Coke and Amex. And the same idea about like buying wonderful companies and holding them for the long term, he, he talked about that a lot, like the benefits of, of staying with those things through all the ups and downs. And, you know, that can be very hard for people, not just the downs, but the ups, like for people like us that are value investors, you know, you own these great businesses, you're like, oh, it's getting too expensive. You know, I got, I got to cut, it's getting too expensive. I got to remove it from the portfolio. And like, you're, you're almost always, you know, if, if you've got these good, high quality companies that are going to stay the course for the long term, I mean, you, you're almost always wrong when you do that. And, and so I think that's one of the things he's done really, really well. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see like how Apple plays out from this perspective. Like, I mean, some people are questioning Apple a little bit right now, but it's a huge portion of his portfolio. It's a good quality company. Um, it'll be in interesting to see what he does with this, like as he moves forward. The look through on these that I always have, not to overuse the look through term for stuff, but it's so many times he packages it back to what are things that Americans need? And that's, that's such a focal point in solving for Americans first versus somewhere else. And that, that specific Amex and Coke point that you just brought up, that one hit me hard reading this in, and I know we said it a million times, but it's just, sometimes you read it and you're like, yeah, this is interesting because he's framing up. I can stick with this. I don't have to worry about the trim or the adjust or whatever the else through a lot of these things so much, just because I have faith Americans will continue to use these products and services in some way to our mutual benefit, shareholders, Americans, et cetera. That's, that's a really powerful way to tether that mindset to what you're actually doing. I love this. He wrote this about uh, Coke and Amex. He said, the lesson from Coke and Amex, when you find a truly wonderful business, stick with it. Patience pays. And one wonderful business can offset the many mediocre decisions that are inevitable. I thought that was a good way to sum it up. It's like... It's like anything else. It's the value investor version of the venture capital thing, right? Coke and Amex can paper over a lot of other silly accidents or things where crazy stuff happens. I'm going to talk about one of those things in a minute too. But it's just like the venture investor has a bunch of zeros on the way to getting the big return from the thing that goes all the way till it goes public or something. Berkshire Hathaway has a bunch of these keystone investments that basically help paper over a lot of the other problems over time. And that's a really powerful lesson because I think it kind of shows up everywhere over and over in life. Losses are inevitable. They're to be expected. So what do you have going on that's going to help offset the hard stuff? That's an excellent point. And, you know, he's he said that time and time again, that, you know, it's been a handful of winners that have driven the vast majority of the the performance with Berkshire and it's, it's the same with, um, you know, portfolios a lot of times and even, even market cap weighted indices. I mean, it's those companies that become, you know, great compounders are the ones that are really driving most of, of the return. So that's an excellent point. Um, just in terms of the types of, uh, businesses that he looks for, um, you know, one of the things that is very important to him, and this is why I always kind of found the Burlington Northern acquisition a little interesting. Um, but, you know, he wants to find companies that can basically deploy capital and get high returns on their invested capital. So that's that's a very important quality that companies can take the earnings that they're making and reinvest those earnings effectively. And if you think about it, that's like a capital allocation decision. Companies have a whole bunch of choices that they can do with their profits and their cash. Um, including returning uh, capital to the shareholders and paying dividends. Buffett and Berkshire doesn't pay a dividend um, because he would rather try to reinvest, whether it's in stocks or 
buying stakes of, of uh, private companies and get a return on that for his shareholders. But I think this idea of you know deploying capital into projects or investments um, that can then generate high returns is a very important one. And it does show up in you know, a lot of investment strategies, whether qualitative or quantitative. Yeah, that, that idea, like capital allocation, you realize the more you're in the market, the, how important that is. Like getting a management team that gets that right is so essential. And like that, that's why I think one of the big reasons Buffett focuses so much on the people running these companies is that he, he knows that like w- when they do have that excess capital, what they do with that is going to be a huge determinant of what they, how well the company does over time. So I think that's really important. And I also thought it was, I've always thought it's very interesting that Buffett, you know, doesn't like dividends. And I, and I totally understand why he doesn't like dividends. Um, you know, he has better things to do with the money. Um, so why, why would he not, you know, dislike dividends? But I thought those were both two interesting takeaways for me. And it's so interesting because he's thinking about it. He's thinking about it as the owner of this entity with all these sub entities that pay dividends that he then gets to allocate. And he's also thinking of it as the owner of Berkshire stock. And like, what the hell am I supposed to do with these dividends if I pay them out of the company to myself? Which is a really interesting way to think about it from a really like as a business owner standpoint too. I think that's really cool. Just going back to the Munger thing, one of the really interesting takeaways for me from this was this idea of having a voice that disagrees with you. Um, because we've talked this whole time about, you know, buying wonderful companies at, you know, reasonable valuations. I mean, that was not Buffett at the beginning. You know, Buffett was the deep value guy at the beginning. And Munger is really what got him to what he is today. And, you know, he probably would have gotten there eventually on his own. But, you know, Berkshire's history might look really, really different if Munger wasn't there. So I think about that, like in our own investing is, you know, we're quant investors and we get trapped in like, you know, this, this factor, is it dead? Is it not dead? And like, there's obviously a lot of arguments on both sides, but you always want to have somebody who looks at things in a different way than you do, because if, if whatever you're doing ends up not working anymore, like having that person who tells you as early as possible, you know, and makes you really question what you're doing and, and take a really deep look at it, it is so, so important. And, and that was a role Munger did a great job of playing for Buffett. Not that he would have just gone on probably to keep trying to do workouts and cigar butts and all that stuff. But yeah, without Munger and, and that realization, you need a partner, you need partners in life, be it your spouse, be it your friends, you need partners in business. You need, you know, the Validia Capital guys on your side. Um, you need stuff like this to basically say, I'm up to a certain size. And I love this too. What, I don't have the quote right in front of me. He has the thing about how Munger tells him. He's like, and Charlie told me this was a disastrous investment or this was like a terrible investment that I made in this Berkshire company. But I guess, I guess you are going to have to work this out, Ward, and just knock off doing that stuff. And w- we got to reinvent this thing going forward. And that's a, as value investors, like a really interesting thing, right? To say this works up to a certain size, but then we have to change strategy once our investment, once our fund, what's our thing. If you're a business owner, the business you build, once you hit a certain point, you can't do some of the stuff you did that got you off the ground in the first place. One of the things that jumped out at me is um, he wrote, we have an alliance to shareholders and country. And he kind of goes on to talk about how Berkshire Hathaway is sort of like, not the lender of last resort, but I mean, I think he has like 150, 160 billion in cash. And I've always, that level of cash has surprised me in a lot of ways because I would imagine if that was being put to work, if he could find opportunities, you know, it would have been generating more. Although it's, you know, with, with, with where rates are, where they are today, it's not like he's not, he's probably getting four or 5% on it. So it's still a significant amount of money. But, you know, this idea that Berkshire can kind of come in during these crisis times, whenever those come in the future and be there, I think is becoming, to me at least, it seems like that's becoming a very important uh, sort of part of what he wants to do here Um, and why Berkshire's just pure size can be very important when the market, you know, has this, its next big disruption and this idea, and it kind of plays into the Burlington Northern thing a little bit too. Like my sense in reading it is Burlington Northern is not really 
doing that well and it's requiring a significant amount of investment. Um, and, you know, he kind of was talking about, I got the sense, you know, people don't want to be working out in the cold in Montana and, you know, laying railroad tracks, kind of. It's not like the, the best job in the world. But Burlington Northern's importance in terms of moving freight in this country now and in the future is kind of critical to our country's infrastructure. So this idea, it's, I don't know, I just got the sense he was kind of coming way up in terms of like the patriotic mission, if you will, of Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know if you guys feel about that, if that makes any sense or not, but. Wait, wait, so I felt this too. And I'm just curious, do you think this is part of like, has there been a tonal shift to you in this with him writing about the stuff like this and the way he's framing it? Because I do kind of feel like post-financial crisis with the rail lines and some of the gas pipeline stuff, there has been a little bit more of a, there's a different level of attention paid to American infrastructure and some of the other stuff. And I wonder if that's almost a, like a legacy thing. Does that, do you have any insight on that? This is like a, a, a Lawrence Cunningham question, like going back in time. Has this always been there and I'm just feeling it extra lately? No, I, I think that he's brought up like in the past, like I think, I think Berkshire Hathaway is the largest payer of federal income tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might, it's one of the largest employers. I mean, I, you know, the energy, the energy division is, you know, huge in terms of producing energy for certain parts of the country. Like you mentioned, there's some natural gas stuff in there. So I do think, I think a lot of guys like Buffett too, are sort of in, like the railroads. They love like railroads and stuff like that, but it does. It all, it, it's all like the importance of like a, the American infrastructure and sort of like a Midwestern thing, right? It's like what it takes to do hard work and get stuff done, whether or not, I don't know if it's changed that much. And maybe it has just because I think the pure size of the company, I think he knows maybe that's that it. this is an incredibly important com company versus like 20 years ago, it was big, but it wasn't nearly as big or as important to the overall economy. And he's also got, I mean, he's got to be thinking, like Matt said, he's got to be thinking legacy as well. I mean, he's, he's, at the, he's getting towards the end of the road here. Like, I think he probably wants to, sh you know, and Berkshire was certainly a significant asset to the United States of America. I think he wants to show, you know, as much as he can that it was. And, you know, part of that, though, is I think he maybe goes a little bit far with that. And I do want to read this part about, because one of the things you alluded to before, Justin, is his ability to jump in during crises, um, like he did in 2008. Um, and, and one of the interesting things about that is, and I want to go back to Matt's point about like the size of Berkshire too, but given the size of Berkshire, that's one of his few places he can find an edge anymore, um, right. is this whole idea of coming in during these crises. And I'll, I'll just read, he said, Berkshire's ability to immediately respond to market seizures with both huge sums and, and certainty of performance may offer us an occasional large scale opportunity. Though the stock market is massively larger than it was in our early years, today's active participants are neither more emotionally stable nor better taught than I was in school. For whatever reasons, markets now exhibit more casino-like behavior and they, than they did when I was young. The casino now rides in many homes, resides in many homes, and daily tempts the occupants. When economic upsets occur, as they will, Berkshire's goal will be to function as an asset to the country. And that may be true, but also Berkshire made, Warren made a boatload of money in 2008. And, you know, to some degree, he does build this like Uncle Warren image a little bit about like he's coming in to save the country. And, you know, he's not coming in to save the country if he's not making money along the way. And he, he may get both benefits along, you know, with it. But certainly in 2008, a huge part of it is he saw very attractive assets at very attractive prices and he got very attractive terms and he came in with tons of money and he helped the country, you know, along with that. There's a, there's a lurking thing in my brain. I don't know if you saw Dave Nottig's zine that he put out uh, in the last couple of weeks. You want to get on that mailing list if you haven't, but I think I need to do a Charlie Munger, Uber Alice thing and send it to him for the next one. Because yeah, the, it just feels like the, American legacy like rhetoric is dialed up a little bit here. And to your point, yes, it served shareholders very, very well too. It played an important part in helping out the country in time of crisis. But to me, this is, this is the natural extension of the opportunistic attitudes they've taken in the risk and the reinsurance markets in the past. It's like good value investing at scale understands that sometimes it's not about predicting the catalyst that creates the opportunity. Sometimes we get obsessed with what's the catalyst that realizes the opportunity. So I own the thing. Then I need everybody else to figure out why I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And then I make the money when that happens. 
the reinsurance kind of approach to this thing is I wait for the thing that nobody was expecting that everybody panics so I can step into the hole and then buy the thing just so it can normalize again. Berkshire Hathaway wears that hat like nobody else's business. And I, I respect the flex as much as I acknowledge the flex. Yeah, it's, it's unique. I mean, no, nobody else can do what he does. Like what he did in 2008, nobody else can do that because of not just the money he has, but the credibility that comes along with the money. Like the fact that Warren Buffett is buying in, that, that puts bottoms in things. Like, you know, there's so much credibility associated with that. So he's in such a unique position. And it's, you know, he should make money when he does it. I mean, that's the whole point. I'm not, I'm not criticizing him for making money. I'm more criticizing him for saying like, you know, this is not all about, you know, being an asset to the country. This is also about Warren saw a very attractive investment opportunity then and took advantage of it and, and probably was an asset to the country in the process of doing that. And I'm sure JP Morgan and whoever did it, you know, turn of the century in the banking crisis is too. It's like, you know, pre-fed the assets to the country or the assets of the country backing this stuff. And yeah, you know, I'll, I'll acknowledge it in extra emphasis. And I'm pretty sure I'm, I think I'm taking this from Barry Ritholtz, maybe from his book from forever ago about the crisis, but the Uncle Warren good housekeeping seal of approval is real. And hey, that's that's some intangible value for you right there. And I wonder just before we hand it back to you, Justin, I'm just wondering too, like how that changes um, in the future. Like when Warren's not around anymore, like does Berkshire still have that power um, to do these kind of things? Or is some of the credibility of this gone? I mean, he's certainly gonna still have the talented people who will be able to make these deals. He's still gonna have, they're still gonna have the resources to make the deals. The question is, does that credibility still come in as strong as it did in 2008 when Buffett's not behind it? Is that some of this legacy dialing up that we're sensing in this letter? Like, is that some of that? And that's human and it's real. It's not right or wrong. It's just, it's very interesting to me too. On, on that point, you know, when you read, and he's been saying this for a while, he's, you know, given Berkshire size, he's like, don't expect anything great out of this. Like, like, you know, we can't find that many opportunities. And to your point, the opportunities that, that, that are going to be big, you know, largely are going to come during probably economic crises or hardships or, but I couldn't help but thinking like Warren Buffett is the only one that can probably say, Hey, listen, the returns aren't going to be that the returns in the, in the future aren't going to be nearly as good as they are, have in the past. And when he's, and I think people accept that because they trust him, they admire him. He's built this incredible company along with Charlie. But when Buffett's not here in the future, will investors still accept that? Or will, I can't help but think, you know, activists sort of trying to come after Berkshire Hathaway, maybe break it up maybe pay investors a huge dividend with all this cash on hand. I mean, right now, uh, you know, no one can do that. But in the future, when it's not Warren Buffett, you know, that that company could come under attack. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of that will be probably uh, have to be fended off by the, whoever Buffett hands over the reins to. Um, didn't, uh, he's gotten didn't those Chris couple Davis, guys. Didn't Chris Davis talk about this as a risk when we interviewed him? This idea that he's he's he has some because he's on the board he had some concerns about like how this might play out in, in a post Buffett world with Berkshire. Mm -hmm. Forget exactly what he how he, I mean I think what Larry Cunningham would say is that the shareholder base is such high quality that you know you're not going to be able to convince you know but all those shareholders eventually they're not all going to live forever so you know you have some of that just naturally through attrition. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see for sure. Yeah. And this, you know, one of my ideas was this idea of like building a lasting organization is one of the things I took from this. Cause you know, he does, he references the lieutenants in here. Like, it seems like he's trying to do everything he possibly can to make Berkshire an organization that is going to survive and be just as good beyond him. But it's interesting to think about, is he fighting a battle? Like he can't a hundred percent win because he's such a huge part of this. Like no matter what he does, Berkshire will be a little bit different, may maybe subject to more threats or, or whatever it is. Like the culture will change a little bit. Like is is there any way he can make it exactly the same when he's gone? That is control. This is the financial planning conversation we track back to over and over again. Consumption or a gift. Guess what? You built up this asset, you're gifting it away to future shareholders, and we're going to see the way it plays out. And the, uh, Justin, I was looking for it when you were talking about just the size, because I, I kept thinking it's 6%. 
he talks about their their gap net worth. Do you guys remember this section? Recorded by any American yes. business, it's the largest. And that means the year and figure of $561 billion, the total gap net worth for the other 499 S&P companies, a who's who of American business was $8.9 trillion. And that is just... It's just staggering to think that they occupy 6% of the universe in which they operate in. There's no way to double that base in a short amount of time. And yeah, we have no possibility of eye-popping performance. It's literally a statement in this letter from this point, which means no possibility of eye-popping performance. I heard somewhere that, you know, eye-popping performance is something people look from for, to their stock returns for. Not that this is going to turn into, you know, raisins and turds NFTs or something, although I guess it could. But uh, there's there's definitely a compelling thing that once he's gone, people might try to shake this thing up. Yeah, that, that gets to like one of the points I had that you brought up earlier, which is this extreme limitation of his size. You know, you brought up this idea of no possibility of eye popping performance. And he says in there as well, there remain only a handful of companies in this country capable of truly, truly moving the needle at Berkshire. And I mean, how many companies, Justin, do you think there are? that like he could invest in that actually would mean something to Berkshire. I mean, it's, it's a very, very small universe, right? I would, I mean, yeah, I would imagine. I mean, you have a hundred, he has 160 billion in cash. Uh, you know, if you sort the S&P by market cap, um, you know, there's pro I, I'd have to look, but you know, there's, I, what would you think? There's maybe like 50 companies or maybe 70 companies that have a market yeah, cap of less. Of, of less than, yeah, right. Like in this, this gets at the it's extreme huge. challenge of what he's trying to do here. Like, I mean, think about us like running these multi-factor models. Like, you know, we've got our 2,700 stock universe. You know, take that down to like less than 50 companies and say, this is all you can invest in, you know, beat the market every year. Like that, that's an incredible, that's a much, much harder challenge. Now in, in recent years, it's actually been better. We would have been better off probably just buying the 50 companies. Yeah. But, you know, you think about it over the long term, you know, that bit of a universe, I mean, it's something that's like can't be done what he's being asked to do at this point. Scale is such at this level, scale is such a detriment to what you're trying to do. I mean, I'm sure there's tons and tons of companies that are out there that Buffett could look at right now and say, you know, not tons, but there's, there's a decent number of companies that he could look at in the small and mid cap space and be like, this is a good company I'd want to invest in, especially because a lot of those companies are way cheaper than the large caps right now. But he can't do it. It makes no difference. Like if he did it, he could buy the whole company and it would have no impact on Berkshire. So it's not even worth his time. Like it just gets it. It's such an extreme challenge he has right now. And people want to criticize, you know, put the chart up of Berkshire against the S&P 500 in the past decade or whatever. I mean, as we do that, we also have, also have to acknowledge how incredibly hard it is, what he's trying to do, given, given the size and scale he has. It's, I think this is fascinating from the, from the capital allocation standpoint and just thinking of all the different things that you could do with it going forward. I'm thinking about the Outsiders book. I'm thinking about how when Google divides up into like Google and Alphabet and all the different things, I think about how entities try to solve for this size problem and there's just, there's no good answer. <laughs> if you want to keep growing beyond a certain point, it's harder and harder to have an impact. And that is massively what he's dealing with right here and right now, which is fascinating to watch because what a ride. Just from a, a flow of capital standpoint, one of the things that I found interesting was he was talking about, and we don't need to spend too much time on this. I just think it's an interesting idea when you, when you kind of flow it through, which is because Berkshire Hathaway has the ability to buy back shares, and I think had been buying back shares, the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway, their indirect ownership in the company's that Berkshire owns, so Apple, Coke, American Express, that ownership effectively goes up because Berkshire's retiring its shares and your stake in Berkshire becomes more when a company uh, you know, buys back those shares. And so therefore the indirect ownership in those holdings also goes up. So, so just passive investing up. isn't breaking the market. Warren Buffett <laughs> is breaking the market. Uh, just maybe Carbono that's, a, yeah. yeah. Maybe, <laughs> that might be it, Matt. <laughs> it's it's effectively like the double buyback, right? You know, like you got all these politicians getting all angry about buybacks. You've got Apple buying back its own stock, right? You've got Berkshire buying back its own stock. Like you're you're getting the double buyback when you when you own Berkshire. 
that's the new strategy, double buyback strategy. We got to implement that. Can we that. come up with a quad screen for the <laughs> double buyback? I mean, there's not going to be too many examples. It's gonna work. Just we're just going to own Berkshire. Yeah, that's going to be our screen. It's going to be like, just buy Berkshire. So one of the ones I wanted to mention too was there's, I always look for, again, as a longtime reader and fan of these, I love the mistake section. I love the way Warren Buffett talks about getting something wrong. The the BHE earnings disappointment section in this one did not disappoint. He he opens that section with our second and even more se severe earnings disappointment last year occurred at BHE. Most of its large electricity utility businesses, as well as its extensive gas pipelines, performed about as expected. But and then he gets into it. California wildfires profitability controls post COVID all this madness has been happening with these utilities and it's been a real dog in the portfolio. So like he's not hiding from this. This is like a full mea culpa by the end, because after then the detailed explanation of like why we thought this was a good idea and all the things that happened, he ends with, I did not anticipate or even consider the adverse developments in regulatory returns. And along with Berkshire's two partners at BHE, I made a costly mistake in not doing so. Man, that hits hard when you have somebody just fessing up to that level of, man, I made a costly mistake alongside these two partners. How, how do the mistake six sections hit you guys? Like, does this just feel otherworldly to you the way that he exposes these? I mean, I think exactly like the way you, I mean, to me, it's like he it wants to make sure that the shareholders feel like he's being truthful and honest with them. And they've never hidden from their mistakes going all the way back to buying Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, so it's sort of just, I think like having that type of relationship with your, you know, the people that are, are trusting you, whether it's your customers, your shareholders, whoever, I think that that's, I think that's a positive. Um, I think people that are always just talking about like why they're so great and not like the mistakes they made, like it's just to me, I don't like those are the types of people I wouldn't want to be invested with or do business with or whatever. And but there are some people out there like that. Um, but Buffett's not one of them. I mean, I think the mistakes are an important part of sort of building that trust and and that connection, if you will, with the shareholders. Yeah, it's, it's great that he's able to do that. And because he's one of the best investors of all time, he sets a great standard like for everybody in terms of doing that. You know, it would be much harder for, you know, the guy managing $2 million that's dramatically underperforming the S&P to be like, you know, here are all my mistakes I made. You're like, everybody's going to pull the money, but he's Buffett. Like he, he can do this and, you know, everybody knows who he is. And, and so it's not going to negatively affect him. And the other thing I was thinking about with this is like, this is something that I wish we could do. Like we don't, as quant investors, you don't really get to do this because, you know, the quant is all about the process. Like you can't be like, you know, you know, maybe 55, 60% of the time you're going to be right. The rest of it, you're going to be wrong. Like, and the, the being wrong is part of what you do. It's part of the process. It's why these, you know, factors work over time. And so we can't be like, you know, look at this terrible stock we bought. Like this is, this was a horrible decision and we're going to make changes in the future because of this. Like if you start doing that in the quant world, it's actually bad because you start taking a process that works and you start adjusting it to try to get rid of these losing positions, even though they're inevitable. So like, uh, I'm waiting for us to be able to write our annual letter, Justin, and being like, Let, let's dig into this mistake we made in this particular position, you know, and learn from it in the future because we can't really do it. It's such an interesting thing that, like, I'm trying to think. Not that, I don't know, who, who's the biggest, like, like AQR? Like, who are the biggest quant shops? And is there any equivalent to the Berkshire letters in, like, a, I don't want to say apologizing for the computers, but you know what I mean? Like, is there yeah, any Cliff quant does a really good job, too. Like, That's Cliff does a really good job. Yeah, Cliff does a really good job of admitting his mistakes. He does a really good job with that too, but it's like the mistakes more relate to process than positions, right. I, I think is the difference. So like as quants, we can, we can apologize for our process. We can, you know, say we've learned from, you know, whatever's going on or changes in the market. You know, it's just, you, you never want to apologize for, you know, I bought this stock because that, that's just a, a byproduct of the process. One of the other, just as we kind of get closer to the end here, one of the other, just from an investing standpoint, um, I think it was maybe two years ago. I might not have my timing exactly correct, but he made those investments in those five Japanese conglomerates, which he discussed in the letter. And what's interesting with that, his timing, by the way, was pretty much spot on because, you know, the Japanese market has come back a lot in the last few years. 
And I think those companies have actually, I mean, those are major, large companies. And I think it's called the, the Sogo Sosha group is, which is like the way that conglomerates are called in, in Japan. Um, but what's interesting about that is just from a shareholder friendly practice standpoint, these, a lot, these five big conglomerate companies, I mean, they're buying, as Buffett pointed out, they're buying back shares. Their executives have lower compensation than here in the U.S. And he kind of pointed out to this is this interesting thing that he sort of views this as like partnerships. So as they find opportunities to invest in, you know, he, Berkshire might be able to co-invest with these large sprawling companies uh, over in Asia and Japan. So I thought that was sort of an interesting because Buffett is mostly known for, you know, investing here in U.S. companies not so much uh, international, although he does have some. I think at one point it was mostly Munger that had that Chinese electric car maker uh, stake in that. Anyways, so that's just from, you know, one, one of the things that jumped out from an investing standpoint. Do you think yeah, he's yeah. looking for good housekeeping seal of approval, like in Japan too? Like, is there is there a multinational legacy play here? Is there any... I think Buffett's just, very. I think Buffett's very respected in Asia. Um, uh, kind of like figurehead status, like he like he is here. I don't know if uh, if if that's the any of the motivating factor, but I mean, I think these are large companies that he can deploy, you know, a pretty significant amount of capital. In. Um, and the values were good when he bought in, and like they have good qualities, you know, inside them. Remember that uh that work Dan Rasmussen did around this? Like, I believe bankruptcy in Japan is not even a thing. Um, like it's just a completely different market. Like, because when they tested the value factor in Japan, like one of the big risks of the value factor in the US is you have these bankruptcies among these cheap price to book companies. Right. But in Japan, like I think it did even better because that risk doesn't exist. Um, like like basically the companies don't I don't know the exact details, but companies essentially don't go bankrupt in Japan in, in the way they do here. And and by the way, there's some type of initiative like at the government level with trying to encourage more of their public companies to do more shareholder friendly type of initiatives. I don't know if that's dividends or whatever, but the government has like instituted some um, type of policy framework to try to improve like the underlying operations and therefore the the stock valuations over there. So I'm just, uh, I'm curious, Justin, as, as we wrap up with this, like, what do you think, since you're a resident Berkshire expert, like, how does this change when Buffett's not around in terms of the letter, the meeting, like how much of this still goes on and how much of this, is this something that dies out over time? Um, I, I really could go both ways on that. I'm not really positive, like, cause they're, they're gonna have to put somebody up there, you know, answering the questions and, and it won't be the same as, as it was with Warren and Charlie in terms of the joking and, and all of that. Like, wh what do you think all of this? changes to when he's not around? I mean, it's a good question. It probably depends on whoever takes the reins, how much they, I guess, continue to honor like Buffett's legacy and trying to be consistent with everything that he's built and said and, and sort of the overall brand and ethos that Buffett represents. That was one of the things that Jason Zwag pointed out. And I think it was a conversation with David Perel. I, I'm not sure, but it was like the consistency of like Buffett and Munger over, you know, a however many year period from 1965. I mean, yes, the investment process has changed, but effectively over the last 30 years, the message has been consistent and you know what you're getting. And, you know, I think if that continues, then a lot of this can continue. But I think Matt, and what we talked about earlier, it's kind of an interesting point that will the company come under attack and could there be pressures and influences from the outside that might try to do different things with the company or bring it in different directions or make it pay a dividend or whatever um, that, you know, that could be that could be a big risk when when Buffett's not there because people might challenge, you know, the direction of, of the company in some, in some way. So it's, it's a good, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, um, 
how it plays out. I have a couple other just quick stats for you and then a question, okay? So uh, two, first of all, just, in, and he always lists this, but it needs to be said. From 1964 to 2003, 19.8% annualized return to Berkshire Hathaway stock versus 10.2 for the S&P 500. Cumulatively, that's 31,000% versus 4,300 roughly, let's say 4,400% for the S&P 500. So it just is an amazing, like if you take like, you know, 19% versus 10.2, it really just demonstrates the power of compounding. And I mean, over such a long period of time, it's just unbelievable in terms of the wealth that that's created and that's we'll go back to that in a second but i thought this statistic was interesting too so charlie munger lived under 15 of the 45 presidents that america has had which is pretty yeah. crazy when you think about it i mean he lit he, he was alive for a third of all presidents that this country has ever had it's pretty crazy how many election cycles? And that's endure. why he was so. And that's yeah. why he was so bitter with the politicians because he's like right. sick of this. <laughs> he, it's like not enough. He's like one. they still. He's like they haven't gotten anything done in Washington since I was fifteen years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask you this: I'm curious to see if you guys does the name Ruth Gotsman mean anything to you, or do you know? Would you happen to know why that would come up in this conversation? I do not. Matt, okay. not positive. Is she one of like the quirky Omaha people or something or is? Well, close. So her okay. husband, David, which he died in, uh, he died in 2022, was a very, very long time Buffett friend and investor in Berkshire Hathaway. And earlier this year, Ruth made a $1 billion donation to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx that will cover all tuition for all students in the future. And that was all done because of the wealth that they accumulated uh, through Berkshire Hathaway, which I think is just an amazing story that, you know, someone that was that lucky, uh, you know, can do that for, for a college. And I mean, we need medical, we need more medical people in this country and all over the world. So, you know, that's great that tuition is going to be paid for, for all those future students. And it's all through Berkshire stock, which is awesome. So did the, did the, did the school sell the stock after the charitable gift? Did they hedge it? Good did question. I don't, it? I don't know. <laughs> Are you saying charitable giving is breaking the market? Just like <laughs> charitable giving is breaking. No, that's, but that's breaking. amazing. That, that's yeah. an utterly amazing thing. That's so cool. And again, I think it, it's, it's reinforcing the shareholder ethos and the point that I was making at the open about like how he takes this like status thing and inverts it automatically from the beginning. Like he sticks the landing on this. The last four or five paragraphs are just also beautifully done and beautifully exited. He, 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 ex Charlie's not coming to Omaha this year for the annual meeting. So by that point you're crying. And then he's telling you birdie's still going to be there. Cause she comes back every year and he pleads with you to come join and basically feel like family because what is it about Omaha and was it these things this aspect of building community in this way is the most profoundly stunning thing and getting to celebrate stories like that charitable gift that's an incredible thing for a community to get together and celebrate like this and by the way, if we're going to keep doing these questions at the end of the episodes, we're going to have to start feeding Jack the answers because it's it's getting embarrassing. I mean, Matt did everything he could to get me to get over the top by Sylvester Stallone in the last episode. And like, I still couldn't get it. And then in the last breaking news, you had, you had essentially told me the answer was Michael Jackson to the question and I still got it wrong. So uh, we're going to, we're going to have to come up with some way for me to actually get one of these questions right. If we're going to continue them. When Jack Forehand invested in BHE, him and his two other partners were solely, yeah. Don't worry. We're going to start feeding you the answers. Extra quiz Good. show from here on out. Don't worry. Just don't, just don't tell the people listening. <laughs> Never. <laughs> All right, guys. Good stuff. We appreciate everyone listening. We'll see you next time. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube. 
or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.